Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. What's up, folks? Yep, it's that time. It's time for another exciting episode of the Rich Redman Show where we get together, us drummers, a lot of drummers. I mean, I have comedians and thought leaders on and stuff, but you guys want to hear from the drummers, man. It's the low-hanging fruit, the special people in my life, the people in the special brotherhood sisterhood of the drum we're doing it again today and today's guest very excited i haven't seen him in a long time i'm, I'm excited to look at him in this little square on zoom <laughs> it'll do but I, I miss him we're gonna catch up here um today's guest is the longtime drummer with the zach brown band grammy award-winning zach brown band since 2008 and it's our friend chris fryer what's up partner thanks for being here man hello nice. thank you thank you so much for having me Oh, man, you're a world class player and just a kind, kind man. And we have not spent a lot of time together, but um, I have consumed your body of work here in the last, well, I mean, 12, 15 years or however long you've been doing the band. And we'll see each other backstage at the, the ACMs yeah. or the CMAs. And you taught at my drum camp, I think, in like 2016. The kids loved you. They were like hanging on every word you had to say. But it's just great to see you, man. It's good to see you, Rich. It's uh. We never get to see each other, but it's because we're always working, and that's a good thing. It is a very good thing, and Jim will attest to that, my co-author, co-producer there, Jim McCarthy, Jim McCarthy, voiceovers.com. He plays drums for fun. He takes the sweat, the heartache, and the pain out of drumming. He just It's all enjoyment for him. Jim, what's been up, man? You know, you, you were producing like 25 podcasts. Thank you for doing this at 10 in the morning. That's early for musicians. <laughs> not for me i mean you know i'm up at six so no i know if you this have kids you're, if you have kids you're up at six you're like here's your sugary cereal good luck i'm having another cup of coffee oh no 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 we're way beyond that yeah, we're, we're i'm up before the kids yeah. oh yeah 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 so chris you're in um birmingham alabama i like to say living in nashville this for like four four or five months a year this period that we're in right now is like living in birmingham england because it's so gray yeah. and ugly and rah, rah, rah. what's the weather like there we got five inches of snow right now uh here it's you know it's cold it's windy and um it is a typical winter in the south it is gray and overcast and not very fun I know we have to be really self-starters, self-motivators to get our butt out of bed to do anything here in the South during this yeah. time of year. True. Here's the Very gratitude true. play. Just be glad it's not Cleveland. <laughs> you know, right. th okay. that's that's a valid point. I've been in right. Cleveland in the winter, and it is not fun either. Ugh. They have winters that last until June. So <laughs> that's uh, <laughs> and can, being, being a, a former Canadian. <laughs> Uh, I could, I could attest to the whole notion of, uh, you know, you get to May and everything's beautiful and wonderful and spring is there and oh, we've got a nor'easter roaring up the coast. It's going to dump two more feet of snow and at the end of May into June, that I mean, really it, happen. there's problems everywhere. Like my folks are in Florida and they yeah. got to, you know, deal with the, you know, the tornado or hurricanes and we've got the tornadoes hurricanes. here and then yeah. California, yeah. everything's on fire. The mud is sliding. The earth is opening up and the San Andreas falls. Always and something. It's always something, right? So, okay, well, let's talk right. drums here. Chris, you and I have this uh, cool connection in that we're um, connected. I'm four, I think four or five months older than you, but the year was 1970. Dinosaurs roamed yeah. the earth. When did you start playing drums? For me, I was six. Um, I started playing drums in the junior high band at age 12. Oh, okay. uh, when I was six, I started playing guitar yeah. uh, with my father. Um so drums was actually my second instrument, uh, but it's the one I took to much easier. Um, and and actually, strangely enough, I didn't really have my eyes set on being a professional drummer right at first. I really wanted to be a baseball player. Wow. And was starting to, yeah, I was starting to get good at being a baseball player and broke my leg wow. at the beginning of the summer. And had to spend an entire summer. I could not play ball. I couldn't go outside and play. I literally laid on the couch with a pair of drumsticks and a pillow and practiced drum rudiments. 
for an entire summer. And at the end of the summer, I realized, oh, I'm much better at playing drums than I am at playing baseball. <laughs> interesting. Interesting. Because, you know, the guitar, my parents bought me a guitar around that same time. And I was just like, I, I don't know. I got these little stubby fingers and it just seemed like, you know, this is like 10 drumsticks. You know what I mean? It's the same thing with right. piano. And then you start. Yeah, uh, so uh, yeah, I just I was called to the drums, too, man. But having that that skill set, and that knowledge, especially that harmonic knowledge is probably had to really helped you over the years it 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 did it played a an interesting role in my education because uh i went to north texas for a year wow and yeah and so that was my freshman year of college and it was my first time really away from home um and i didn't enjoy being away from home and i didn't enjoy what was at the time a super uh, high intensity competitive atmosphere and it just i wasn't prepared for that yeah um it, and so it, it i did not do well in that set of circumstances i learned a lot that place is magical and it always holds a very special place in my heart um and i met a lot of really cool drummers there i met a got to hear a lot of really great and talented musicians there but I leave there and end up school at, uh, going to school at the Mississippi University for Women. Nice in in Columbus, Mississippi. A lot, a lot, um, of, a lot of dating options there, buddy. De well, well, okay, yeah, there there kind of was. And um, <laughs> was there a and, prerequisite uh, to get into that college by chance, or uh, just curious? Well, you know, I I think um, I think the history of that particular school was they had uh, at one point. Maybe it was in the 70s or early 80s. They had um, been sued because they denied admission to a man who was looking to get. Mm -hmm. I think it was maybe uh, into the nursing program. Well, OK. And um, part of the, the whole settlement was they had to open up the school to uh, to male students. It was one of the oldest at the time. It was one of the oldest all women universities for like 200 years. Wow. That's um, incredible. wow. Well, how many guys were there in the music program? Were you the only guy or? I, I was the only drummer in the music program and there was not a drum department. So like it, I literally went from where I was a little fish in a huge pond to being the only fish in no pond. Um, yeah. Well, so you got I all the work. You were, if they wanted a drummer, anyone in the music business, they're a music program. They're going to call you. Yeah. So they, they, I, and, and I did a lot uh, while I was there. The, the interesting thing was I had to become, I had to choose between a, being a vocal major or a piano major. And so my curriculum really sort of centered around being a piano performance major. It's the closest thing. I mean, technically it's a percussion instrument. You bet. Um, and so I had to learn more about music and more about like I was pursuing drums on my own path and my own sort of speed and still like using and utilizing what I had learned and like building on what I had learned while at North Texas yeah. and using, uh, I was smart enough, crazy uh, as I am. Um, I was somehow smart enough to purchase all of the books that were being taught out of while I was at North Texas. So yeah. I had Gary Chafee's patterns, volume three. And that was like the Bible when I was there. I'm looking at it. It's four, four, five feet away from me. Yeah, I mean it's it's pr it, it may be one of the most uh, one of the most valuable things that I purchased uh, throughout the years, and this one was still like it looked like it had been like put together at a Kinko's, you know what yeah, I mean? Totally. Like it was plastic uh, bound on the sides, and it looked like <laughs> it was all handwritten and just photocopied. It was beautiful, beautiful uh, manuscript of material to learn. Yeah, um, and we could we could talk more about that in a minute. But I was pursuing that on my own. And just like slowly making my way through piano lessons. But in the meantime, all of my classes were centered around learning music. And I think that had a great profound effect on me um, to be not so focused on playing drums and more focused on understanding why music works the way that it does. And and I, I, I feel that, that was a very, very good thing for me to learn, especially at that time. Yeah. So much of it I hated at the time, like when I was at Texas Tech University, it was more of a traditional where I got my undergraduate before going to North Texas. Um, it was more of a traditional uh, music pedagogy program. So you had to learn all about the figured bass and all that kind of uh, like Gregorian chants. What? 
I'm like, how is this applying to what I want? I mean, you learn about the, you learn about the entire history of music pre 1900. I mean, like, you know, it, you know, it's crazy. Is crazy. Gregorian chants kind of like where you use it's crazy where you use the uh, like multiple vocal assets of your voice, kind of like you know if you if you ever listen to the dry tracks from uh, the first Van Halen album. Isn't hear, there like uh, isn't there like mic <laughs> isn't there like microtones in there like with the Gregorian? There's chants? like you know he, he's got he's hitting on like harmonies in his own voice. You yeah. know this this raspy yeah. uh, Gregorian. I mean that's a thing. I mean all while wearing multiple. assless chaps. I mean the guy that's is right. a multitasker. So, are there uh, non assless chaps though? <laughs> no, all thing? chaps are assless. That's, that's <laughs> all true. chaps are assless. Yeah. He, just, he just chose not to wear pants yeah. with the chaps. But so. Chris, you know, I'm just thinking about. So if you're in North Texas, <laughs> I got to North Texas in '92, '93. So we're the same age. It, this was supposed to be 1988. Yeah. So I, I, I went. Uh, I attended fall of '89, ah. spring of '90. Yep. Uh, Keith Carlock and I were freshmen at the same same time. Okay, because uh, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, and so yeah, was, man. He wow. Let me tell you, uh, a little side note, man. Like nothing about me here. This is about seeing Keith for the first time. We auditioned to get into the school and into the music program on the same day. He doesn't remember meeting me, but I remember meeting him because he was super shy uh, and. and he was really kind of quiet. He just kind of meekly held his 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 drumsticks in his material that he was going to use to audition with. And I remember the door closed behind him. And I could hear through the door. And he was playing at such a high level on timpani, on snare drum, on xylophone. And then he sits down behind the drum kit that they had in there. And he just starts wearing it out like it owed him money. Yeah. And it was I was immediately taken by, oh, wow, they're like, I've never seen anybody this young be this good. Mm -hmm. And I was immediately a fan of, of how he did things. And, and uh, so the whole time I was there, I would, if he was playing somewhere, I would go seek it out. Yeah. And uh, he did, did some playing and he, man, what a monster player, even from the get go. Yeah. I had, I and had a practice room next to him. Better. <laughs> I did. It's so humbling. Cause, cause, cause here I was like, he, I think, yeah, Keith's a little younger than me. So when I was going there to start my master's, he was like getting ready to get out of school and was pretty much playing full time in Dallas, Texas. And so I had a practice room next to him, yeah. which he really didn't need to ever use. But he would go in there and play like with Aretha Franklin records and stuff and like 90s hip hop and stuff. And I'm like, damn, this guy can shred like Dennis Chambers. And when he practices, he just sits down and plays with Aretha. <clears throat> and yeah. then I would sub for him with Dallas Brass and Electric, this great, amazing horn band. And I was like, this guy is going to do, he's going to change the world somehow. And then as soon as he yeah. left Dallas, he got rid of the double bass and the earth ride and the piccolo snare drum. And then he opened up his drums completely wide open, set them up, took the muffling out of the bass drum, got the K Constantinople's and then reinvented himself in like six months. Unbelievable. Yeah. It was that move so to he, New York, I think was the best thing he could have done. Yeah. So he was more of a heavy player, and then he kind of well, he he could I, shred I really need like to look more into him. Well, he could shred double bass like a, like Pantera, like a monster, yeah. and and like Weckle out and F Vinny out, and it's super crisp and and incredible. And then when he moved to New York, he got the job with the Blues Brothers, and then he started playing in a place called the Fifty Five Bar with Wayne Krantz, and his just style just kind of opened up like a lotus, like. He yeah. would have been he would have been fine never changing from his sound at 23 but right. you know what I mean but then when he moved to New York there's something about I mean I just got back from New York and just that influx of like I was just walking down the street looking for a great bagel and I heard 10 languages you know there's something about right. it yeah. you know tangent it's about a, the double bass thing <laughs> I mean was he you said pant I, mean, I, I know I'm not, that's there's the oh, it was, squirrel. He, he he had ridiculous double bass drum chops at the age of 18. I, I promise like, you, I, I heard it multiple times. <laughs> like what? Like rudiments on the, like similar to like a Virgil Donati that does double strokes and paradiddles. And maybe, maybe stuff not like that. that level. I don't think he had internalized it to that degree, but at that time, nobody was really doing that stuff. It was about speed and precision even then, because right. I, I think, the, you know, that, I think it's safe to say that, at that time in 1989 and 1990 like the double bass drum game was really sort of was still metal by, yeah it was charlie Benante Lombardo. and yeah. yeah exactly so it's like those cats 
and it was precision, it was speed, and it was being you. I mean, it was just starting to be manipulated outside of like you had, still had Terry Bozio doing his thing, and like all the way back to the Zappa days, and there were cats like him and Billy Cobham doing really interesting things, but that was on a much higher echelon, you know, like th- there was, that was a thinking man's game, you know, in terms of like yeah. what was happening in rock and roll and what was exciting all the kids at the time was that speed, you know, yeah. just yeah. blistering machine me. gun kind of speed. Yeah. I, cu- I couldn't imagine playing that fast. I mean, I, I kind of got it down at one point where I my feet just figured it out and I was able to flurry my ankles and that kind of thing. But, you know, it's like, okay, I, it's not the music I really want to play. What's the point? But the first time I ever heard it really varied up was uh, on, I believe, the second Pantera album where Vinnie Paul was doing like, and he was doing those types of things. I'm like, why? Right. Yeah. 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 Hey. yeah. Really, I'm like, that's really interesting. opening up the game. Like, yeah. it, and I, and I, I believe, you know, this is just my opinion. I think Vinnie Paul gets sort of skipped over in terms of his relevance to and contribution to the realm of drumming. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. He was, you know, really Does, great player. Even the sound. I mean, nobody, even, even the sound of that kind of playing, because they took, I believe what like Lars did on the, on the end justice for all <laughs> album, even though it's completely <laughs> lack and devoid of bass. Yeah. Um, his bass drum sound on that album was almost legendary iconic and trailblazing because i don't know what they did to it processing wise it was like they must have put a mic on the attack point on the head right and then just i mean it was just clicky and bassy on what they do i chris i think that they i think that they um they tape a quarter to the impact point on the kick drum and then he uses that that red danmar beater i used to use that red danmar beater it was the metal that was a sound yeah, that that's a sound that permeated the '90s. I mean, that, sure. that really this defined bass drum sound. Sorry, yeah, tangent. Yeah. yeah, no, hang on one second, guys. I got a. I've had a a technical issue. It, I'll explain in a moment. Hang on one Chris, second. Chris, Chris's iPad or iPhone sure. is 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 freaking out. No big deal. Um, that's fine. We'll continue the conversation. <laughs> Rich, you know, Chris. Chris is an amazing guest so far. But we talked in the beginning about you know a lot of drummers coming on. Who are are some of your uh, wish list guests that you'd like to come on, Rich? Oh, um, well, let's put it out there. Yeah, you know the Alzheimer's runs in my family, so I'm having a moment right now. But I, they're all written in the <laughs> they're they're written in the phone. You know, I made this huge yeah. list of you know st- starting like it, for the followers of the show. I'm starting mostly with like colleagues and friends, like people like like I can I can text. And then there's all yeah. sorts of people like, uh, oh, I'm friends with Carol Gad on Facebook, so I'll go through her to get to her husband, you know, that kind of thing. And That'd I have, cool, yeah. you know, and I have reached out to um, to uh, Keith, and like I think Keith will eventually come on, but he goes through seasons where he's just like, oh, I'm just chilling right now, not doing a lot of press. He's out doing the Steely Dan thing, and of course the videos are floating around the interwebs of his his oh, new, yeah. his take on Asia, you know, Jim. Yeah. That was a you know a classic Steely Dan song. We we had Billy Freeman on last week, and Steely Dan's one of yeah. his, favorite, his favorite bands. He's like, I can go do the the job right now. I know the entire body of work. I mean, it's like unbelievable. Um, but but you know, Gad recorded that drum solo in like one take so on one afternoon yeah. in New York City, and then here all these years later, Keith is like keeping it alive and taking it to another level you know it's crazy well just uh, so everyone i'm always excited about the guests we get on the show uh there are guests that i'm really excited to have on chris you being one of them i've been a fan since you guys came out uh the zach brown band for me was such like a punch in the face at the time it was so <laughs> different it was it was like a true breath like there was a breath of fresh air it was different it had an americana feel but also it's like uh <laughs> you guys are like the dream theater of the country genre <laughs> Some jamming oh, wow. going on. That's a, that's a beautiful compliment. That's you can, really uh, cool. You can, you can totally quote me on that. I'll allow it. Um, I, I but, will. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, I mean, you know, because all the all the players in the band are just, my goodness, just you know, and and it's still the mute the songwriting. I mean, everything just like hit us right. At, you know, as a consumer of music, when you guys came on the scene. It, it goes right to the heart of where people are, where they're living. You know, even with Chicken Fried, it had that down home kind of feel to it. It was tight. And then he did the stuff with Chris Cornell. I mean, it was just, oh yeah, my goodness, you know, all the odd time signatures. I mean, um, 
the, the live renditions of Devil Went Down to Georgia. My gosh. <laughs> yeah, dude. Seven it's studio like, albums. I, I lose weight just I mean, listening to it. I, I yeah. mean, I, w- I was reviewing all of it, Jim. And it was like, oh, my God, look at this body of work. When you go on Spotify, you're like, oh, my God, how am I going to consume all this? And every every song is treated so individually, like different drum right. sounds, track to track, and different approaches. Seven studio albums, two live albums, oh, yeah. the greatest hits album. Chris, the latest one, is that From the Road, Volume 1 covers? Yeah. So, that yeah, that's the latest one. And, and we've been recording every show since about 2008. 10 or 11 that's really so we had a massive archive of of live shows to go through wow um our tour manager who's really kind of a savant at creating a set list he keeps a, a spreadsheet of all the set lists so anywhere we, we you want to know where we, we you know what we played on the you know in uh let's just say what we played on night two at red rocks in you know 2013 he's got it on his spreadsheet Woo. And if you remember something <laughs> specifically memorable about, oh wow, I think, I think maybe Devil went down to Georgia was a little extra special that night. Then he makes a note of it, and so he's got yeah. all this stuff. And so when it came time to sort of sift through the archives, he had already been doing most of the heavy lifting for us. And so we just consulted the list and kind of went through things. Nice. And it was, um, yeah, it was a lot of fun, kind of picking and choosing what those were and you know they're not all perfect for everybody but right. it's that's the nature of live music yeah and there's gonna be little nuances here and there where you go oh wow i wish i had played that differently or maybe i shouldn't have been so heavy-handed here on this part but i, I think that's what creates and maintains the humanity yes that yeah. draws us all in you know it, it Half the stuff, I'm I'm trying to think. I'm, I'm trying to remember everything that's on there. I don't think any of it was played to a click. Mm-hmm. Um, if it was, mm-hmm. it was done sparingly and only for the sake of, um, only for the sake of like lining up video and lights for the the production aspect of it. Sure. So there's a lot of times we'll do that. We'll even on our our, our own stuff, we'll have a click, um, and the empty code running with the click and that's triggering all the, the, the bells and whistles, I call it. Yes. Um, and then there might be like a, a sound effect that we don't want to load up somewhere. So like a delayed, um, like on beautiful drug coming out of the, going into the last chorus, you know, there's, there's this, if you listen with headphones, it's going back and forth, you know, it's crazy eh, 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 and it bounces back and forth. Um, so we have that vocal effect yeah. on that click track for that song. But apart from that, you know, like there's nothing else there. It's just for all, you know, timing with the video and lights. But those covers, typically they, they're they all, and I'm sure if you dig in, they're a little, <laughs> if you tempo map it, it's a little, it's a little swervy. But again, that's kind of what makes it fun and, and, and human. Well, that's beautiful yeah. that you use that, that you guys are using all using that side of your brain and like, that's a true homage to music making in the 50s, 60s, and 70s before all the technology creeped in. Yeah. You, know, you know, our band, it's just, you know, we're just playing the 24 hits down. There's not a lot of tricks. There's not a lot of extensions. So kick off the Pro Tools, click Rich, and, you know, and it's just, <laughs> yeah, here we go. It's so modern. But that's got to be a cool feeling to just, like, be able to flow with the things like Russ Kunkel and those dudes and, you know, just keep it real. And you would never know because everything feels so solid and anyways, you know, that's a well, testament to you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, feel is feel has always been important to me. Um, I, when CDs came out um, in in the 80s, it was possible to take a lot of these old, really super funky songs and you could just start the track all over. Oh, man, that's really cool. And so you're at the back end of the you're on the outro van, say, and you start it over and the tempo might be a little different. Yeah. And, and so it was at that, you know, sort of that point in my, my evolution as a, as a player and as a musician, like maybe I should concentrate on making things feel good and like, let that be first and foremost. And probably to my detriment uh, in a, in a sense, because I didn't concentrate as much on playing just dead down the middle and with time. Yeah. Um, 
it, so it, that slowed me down, but I really concentrated on making things feel right. And sometimes it's a nuance of like tapping the hi-hat in just the right way or hitting the snare drum in just the right way to sort of make things sit the way they need to sit. And so to, to, to sort of illustrate the point, um, that, Lady Marmalade. I don't know if you're familiar with the original track, and I, the the original the drummer's name who played on it escapes me at the moment. Yeah, but if you listen to that groove, it's it's really really it's an interesting groove to begin with, right? Um, do, 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 right? Yeah, beautiful beautiful groove. But at the beginning, it's sitting at one tempo, and at the end of the song, it's like 10 clicks faster. Yeah. But you never notice because it feels so good yeah. every step of the way. And that was one of those things that really sort of got into my brain. I was like, oh, wow, you don't, you don't necessarily have to play perfect time as long as it feels good. And so yeah. that took me down a path, you know? Yes, man. Well, I mean, it worked out great. Um, before before you joined the band, I guess Jack Zach Brown was around in two thousand three, and there was this original drummer, Marcus Petruska. Is that right? Petruska? Yeah, Marcus Petruska. Yeah, he's so, a fantastic so, drummer. I'm sure. So, how did this all happen? The transition. How do you end up? Because now you're. I mean, it is it is a beautiful thing. It's so unique, and you get to play with. Uh, Daniel De Los Reyes on percussion, a great, uh -huh. a great cat. You know, you guys got to get to fill out this beautiful percussive fabric. How did this all happen for you, man? Um, well, I, I, I cannot attest to why things lined up for Marcus leaving the band, but at some point in, I want to say maybe late 2007, um, really late 2007 or, or maybe super early 2008 um marcus made a decision to leave the band mm -hmm. and the foundation actually had already been cut and already been done and, and finished and zach was looking to um he was looking to find a record deal and also do radio promotion for the singles that he wanted to put on the radio and they needed a drummer and so i had been uh quite by chance i had been doing this free like this freelance you know every wednesday night jam session a blues jam session in decatur georgia yeah and i would drive from birmingham to what decatur's just outside of atlanta and i would drive basically three hours uh one way play the gig mm. 40 bucks and a meal Yep. Um, which was more often than not a cheeseburger because I could take it with me on the drive home. Um, but I would do that. And I meet this guy who's, who who was a crazy mandolin player. And he <laughs> says, Hey, uh, can I get your number? Cause man, I think we could do some work together. And I was like, great. Yeah, sure. And so Tim used to work for Zach, uh, years ago. And when Zach called him up and said, do you know any good drummers? And Tim hands him, my number and says this is the guy you need to call and tim had jokingly not jokingly he was serious about it but he had said with a little snicker and a smile hey you know you could probably oh, i've had another uh technical ask uh I, sorry <laughs> I, I ipad is it ipad or iphone uh, it's it is an android phone and it's oh. sitting it's so precociously perched maybe i could do this i could do sideways and it'll oh, oh that's, that's great work. that looks even better yeah. yeah hang on that's great um i had it just like ever so precociously perched and i've spilled that's coffee a big word for a drummer man. my uh my hang on i got i've spilled coffee all over my practice pad oh my look at oh, man we're looking if you so guys are watching is... this on youtube you remember you can yeah. consume this on youtube if you guys are just using your ears and we're getting to see chris's practice space a lot of drums oh, microphones God, yeah. he's all ready to ready to do the thing man um, yeah that's well so that's what what you see back here yeah. is uh, it's a small setup that I've. Um, There's gold I've and platinum records on the walls. <laughs> oh yeah, that stuff. <laughs> uh, I've oh been, yeah, uh, those little things. <laughs> you know, it's. It, I will say this: I feel very, very blessed to have those hanging on the wall because at the time that you know, 
at the time that Zach Brown Band kind of came out and, and became Zach Brown Band, I'm going to move this just a little bit. That was the industry uh, was changing I say, so much. right? Yeah. Yeah. So the industry was changing a lot. And we're one of the last, you know, one of the last artists um, to actually experience massive record sales. Um, in a physical format. Get, yeah, in a non-digital format. So, like, we were happening, we, we had already sort of established ourselves, and Taylor Swift was becoming a really big thing. Yeah. And crossing over into pop, and simultaneously, as our as our career is getting a strong foothold, the industry was changing into the digital thing, and and the, so then it became about what, how many streams or how many downloads constitutes a whole record. Yeah, and the um, the RIAA had to start figuring out what that formula was in order to award sort of you know gold record or or platinum record status um I, we you know there's a few of them scattered around the house i don't have one big wall to hang them on um i need you know i need you need more wall walls for, yeah i need well <laughs> yeah well i'm not <laughs> i'm not gonna <laughs> i'm not gonna go get, go get, go out and you know make more walls just to uh hang stuff on it's yeah. <laughs> you know well, that's great, man. I mean, not a lot of people have gold and platinum records on the walls, but then you know the thing that 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 got you the job know, was that was that <laughs> Jim that persistence that your your willingness to drive three hours each way, so six hours yeah. total of travel to play a job for forty dollars and a cheeseburger, and that's yeah. what we that's what we just did as crazy kids. But little did you know that little elbow grease like totally changed the course of your life. Yes, well, and and I I. I'm a firm believer in, you know, you hear a lot of people say, if you just work hard, everything's going to happen. Right. Um, I'm a firm believer in if you really work hard, it doesn't mean that things are going to happen. And it doesn't mean that things are going to go your way. It just means that when opportunity knocks, you have the skill set necessary to seize the opportunity and make the most of it. Um, and it's see a the very important distinction. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I know a lot of really great drummers who shed for countless hours in the practice room, and they never really seem to get their 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 wheels underneath them. You know, they never seem to get their career like kind of going in a in a positive way that they want. Yeah, and it has nothing to do with talent. It has nothing to do with the dedication of the craft. It just there are other skill sets that also need to be developed and, you know, like bringing good gear to the gig, being on time, being dressed appropriately, um, being able to play not too loud or not too soft. Okay. You know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a full range when you're a freelancing drummer and you, you guys know this. I mean, it, when you're a freelancing drummer, there's a, there, it's not just what you play and how you play it. It's, it's also all these other little things that sort of factor in as to whether or not you're going to get work and, and yeah. opportunities will come your way. They always do. But do you have the skill set necessary to seize the opportunity and take advantage of it to the fullest? Yeah. Did you have any idea of like, what was your goal? Like Rich and I talk all the time. Your goal you used to write it down every day, like a mantra that you wanted to be a top call drummer someday in Nashville, Rich. Yeah. And I remember that from some of the things that we've shot over the years. Right. Was uh, there something similar in your life, Chris, that you kind of stuck to? I mean, what? Well, and also, here's a follow up question: the first time that, like, oh my gosh, this is a make it moment. What was that moment like for you? Mm. Um. So, from okay, so I have clearly defined. Let me back up. I'll start again. There was a right. moment in i think probably around 2014 or 2015 so we had been playing bigger venues really big venues um at that point and i had somebody i met somebody at it was a meet and greet kind of situation and the guy goes hey what's it like to finally be a successful drummer and this really sort of hit me in a weird way ah. and i said well I've always been a successful drummer 
And he says, well, I've never heard of you until now. And I thought, wow, man, that's okay. Ouch. But, well, <laughs> how do you, you define success? Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, that's hmm. so that's, that was it. I, I, yeah. I said to him, I said, you know, I don't define success the same way you do. My definition of success is very simple. At the end of your tax forms, there's a box for your signature. And to the right of that box, there's a box that says occupation. And ever since I was 17 years old, success has been clearly defined and simplistically defined as writing the word musician in that box. That means I made my living. The bulk of my income was obtained by being a musician. And by that definition, I was successful every year. And anything above being able to pay my bills was just icing on the cake. Drop and, the and mic. I, yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> I just... I had always, th this gentleman really made me have to put it into words. It was always how I defined it. I never, I, I never really cared much about, you know, being a rock star or any of that stuff. I mean, I did when I was in high school, but then I started working and becoming just a real working drummer. I just want to make my living being a musician and, and being involved in music. It doesn't really matter. As long as I get to make some music, I'm good. And um, I think we get too wrapped up in the things that we, the superficial things that we see um, in terms of like kids being influenced by, you know, they see somebody, they see the follower count on an Instagram account. You know, it's like, oh, they have a million followers. I need a million followers to be successful. Like, okay, if that's how you choose to define it, that's great. But, you know, you can be successful and you can feel successful. It just matters how you define success and then the road path, the, the, the pathway through which you achieve that. I mean, it's, I, I equated it one time to putting a pin on a map, you know, back when we had paper maps. Yes. You know, and I'm, I'm old enough to remember having a, a Rand McNally paper map, you know, yes. <laughs> and you open it up and you figure out where you're going to go and you put a pin in the map or you draw, you circle it with a, a pencil and then you figure out, you know, where you're at on the map. You just figure out which pathway you trace it backwards and you figure out, okay, here's where I am. And I've just traced a line from where I want to go back to where I'm at. And so this is the road I take. And I think if we apply that to our life, uh, regardless of, of what our chosen profession or craft is, you, you figure out, you define success. You, you pick the finish line yeah, and, mm -hmm. and then figure out how, okay, how am I going to get there? And you do that. That's and incredible. It's really, it's really simple. Um, the interesting thing is when you get to that finish line, you can just go to a different place on the map. You know, like, oh, wow, you know what? I've accomplished what I want to accomplish. I'm going to go a little further. And you can do it in, in next, short yeah. increments or, or big increments. It, it matters yeah. not. You know, just it's a it, it, we we all can be successful. We just have to define it. Yes. And, and you know, it's 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 um, this kind of speaks to this something that I mentioned a lot to folks that are like, how can I do the thing that you do? And it's great is you got to operate at the highest levels, but but you also kind of made your own rules. You didn't have to. You spent a lot of time in Nashville, but you didn't move to Nashville, man. You could live where you want to live, you know, which is yeah. which is uh, an it's it's an outlier philosophy. I mean, Zach, does, does he live in Nashville or is he somewhere else? Texas or Oklahoma? He or? has a he has a home in the Nashville area just outside of Nashville. Oh, he's a Georgia he, guy, right? Georgia guy. He's a Georgia guy. He has yeah. his main residence is in Fayetteville, Georgia. Georgia. Yeah. Now, Jim, what was that second part of your question about like, how do you know when you made it or what was it or what? what was yeah. That? You know, <laughs> but That's based on question. his, uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, a lot so, of like, right, I, I will, I will answer that question in a, uh, it, it was a, a, a moment of epiphany. Um, I had not really paid attention to what was happening I just knew that it felt like, and I would say this from time to time, that it felt like we were all strapped to a rocket ship as it was taken <laughs> off somewhere. And we didn't know where it was going to go, but we knew it was going somewhere. And I think the moment that I realized, okay, this is, this is going to be around for a minute was playing at, I, I want to say maybe it was, Fenway Park. It was one of the first baseball stadium shows that we had done 
and we had sold it out and we walk out on stage and everybody's screaming and you know we're the last act of the night and everybody's you know throwing their hands up you know the crowd's going wild and i thought wow okay maybe maybe this is going to be around for a minute and you know we've we've since played there a bunch um you know a, a lot more since that night but it was like taking a taking a moment to take a deep breath and go wow okay this is this is what's happening yeah and, man. and it's but i don't take it for granted either you know it's it's not like i don't expect us to go to you know to every you know major you know huge venue i don't expect us to play uh baseball stadiums it'd be nice if that was all we ever played yeah you know hey whenever but, you can uh excite bostonians that that means you've done something right i mean they've uh they're the most cynical bunch up there, New Englanders. Well, and you know, you know what? I know. Amazingly yeah. enough, that is that is where our fan base is the most rabid. They they that love is us interesting. Up there. Really, no, Boston, Boston will grab on if they like something. They are rabid. They're passionate about it. Yeah. yeah, you know, it's funny. I mean, again, you know, going back to when you guys first came out, uh, it was Chicken Fried, and it was a fun song when that yeah. came out. And it's one of those things, you know, as a guy in radio at the time, who I was, you try and and okay, my immediate mindset was always goes to. Are these guys going to be a one-hit wonder, or is there something else? Because you were so irreverent. You were so, like, you know, <laughs> it was a bunch of guys with dad bods, you know, and that was okay. It's like, oh, they, yeah. they look like me. Jeez, and Jim. It was true. Come on, man. I mean, you know, that's it's still but true. That's, that's the kind of that's the kind of look it was, and I appreciated. Chris that. is like, so I am never this is doing this show again. <laughs> we talking no, about? Man. I don't mean it. No, I you get know. it. No, I mean, chicken fried I, was the was the was the was the party crasher. That was the one that was like put you on the map, right. and then it just got more organic and risk taking and, and left of center yeah. as things went all on, which is so awesome. Yeah. It was, and I don't know if you guys write your own stuff, but the songs or whoever the connections you guys had to the songwriters, it it. So it, it drove right to the heart of what people were feeling at the moment. You got to hit them where they live. Um, you know, remembering, I mean, I remember being at the end of a cul-de-sac 4th of July weekend at my in-laws house and all these people wanted to do was listen to your songs. And that created such an indelible memory for me at that time. My kids wow. were little. I remember it like it was yesterday. I mean, that's the power of music, man. Sure. I mean, that's, and you guys have done an amazing job. I'll tell the Cincinnati story. Okay. Drum roll. <laughs> eight days, eight days we had to spend in Cincinnati doing a lighting job because the other business that I own, we do LED lighting changeovers and stuff. One of our big jobs getting the business off the ground was a, a, about an eight or nine day job. I had to be away from my family up on a lift with tools and just doing repetitive work over and over again. So I'm like, well, hey, I'll put some music on. I'll put Zach Brown band on. So I listened to the music over and over again. I had forgotten about one song. I'm keep in mind, I'm too days away from my family i'm starting to get the the feels right yeah and um <laughs> the man that loves you the most comes oh up. yeah i'm sitting there up in a lift 30 feet in the air a headlamp on my head i've got tools in my hands and tears are pouring out of my eyes going what in the world is happening here i'm just listening to the song i had to stop and just like what i had to call my wife <laughs> like, wow. I told you lately how much I love you guys. That's a great story, oh, well, Jim. That that is powerful. That's beautiful. Uh, thank you for yeah. sharing that with me. That's amazing. Uh, oh man, it's just totally powerful. You guys are the. I always ask a question to some of my podcast guests, especially if they're musicians. I've asked Rich this question. Uh, you know, a lot of the songs that we hear in the '60s, '70s, '80s that lasted generations. You know, the "Don't Stop Believing"s. You got your Africa's, those types of things. Yeah. And I've always asked musicians, what song is being made today? That's going to have that same effect. I think they're getting less and less, but I'm going to say you guys definitely have those songs that generations from now, people are going to be listening to. Nice. Uh, you wow. know, kudos to you on that. But the other aspect, I'll ask you that question. What are the songs in your opinion today that are going to last that you're hearing today? Wow. I, you know, that's tough to say. I just got back from the 38th uh, songwriters festival. Um, literally just last night. Um, I have a fascination with songwriting and there's 
there's oftentimes really great songs that may not get the proper treatment that they need in the recording process. So the presentation is mm -hmm. uh, a hindrance to the enjoyment. Uh, I think it's a fair way to say it. There are other songs that questionable, you know, as to whether or not it's a good song. Um, you know, any song, you know, it's art. At the end of the day, it's art. So it's, you know, art, the beauty is in the eye of the beholder. You know, subjective. it's, um, yeah, it's really subjective. And, you know, it's, there are a lot of great artists around uh, in all the genres of music. And, you know, it, it's really kind of cool to see all these genres of music being able to flourish simultaneously. I feel like, I feel like there's, th there are less and less songs to a degree, but I, I, I attribute that to my age because I remember more of the, the the lightning in the bottle so to speak you know it's it's and we were we were hammered with them through the 80s we in the we early were. 90s but also think back to how many how many songs were there that were radio hits but they just didn't stick around and you eventually you hear it one day and like you know you're at, at the grocery store and you go oh yeah i remember that song but it's yeah. not the first song you think of you know what i mean i i uh, and they were just thousands upon thousands of non you know they were they made the top 40 or they may have gotten airplay on the radio but they were not yeah. necessarily the most memorable iconic thing um and i think timing has something to do with that as well i mean yeah. don't stop believing huge hit and everybody always loves it and and always loves singing along with it but I think it's reemergence and and to exposure to a, a younger generation happened because yeah. of that TV show Glee. And the formatting you know, they, of it too, yeah. Nice. Yeah, it, it's it's any song, any song has potential to be uh, a song that stands the test of time. I think a lot of it is the presentation, you know. And I don't really the you know as of late, I I hate to admit this, but. I really don't listen to a lot of what's on the radio. Um, it's it's not that I don't like what's out there. It's that there's just so much happening all the time. And for, for me and my creative process and, and sort of maintaining my path of learning what it is that I want to learn and accomplish what I want to accomplish, um, it just sort of muddies the waters a little bit. So I'll if someone comes to me with a recommendation and says, "Hey, I, I really think you should check out this artist and their work that they're doing," and and they know me well enough to make that kind of recommendation, then I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in. I'm not gonna put a toe in the water. I'm gonna jump in like cannonball style, just deep dive it. Yeah. Um. And that that's very fulfilling for me. So to, I can't answer your question. I have no idea what's right, gonna right, stand right. the test of time. What's gonna be a song that everyone's singing 10 years from now. Well, come on know? guys, the achy breaky heart, man, come on. Uh, <laughs> hey, you hey. know, had you asked everyone when that thing, when that song was on the radio and I remember when it was, yeah, it, it was everywhere. Right. And no one thought that it was going to be anything more than a flash in the pan at that, at that time, you know, well, there it, it is. A I one and it. done kind of situation. And yet it's still around. You play it on a jukebox. Now people get up and start two step into it. Yep. It's, you know, it's somehow withstood the test of time. And an argument could be made that it was a great song. And an argument could be made that it was an awful song. Sure. It, you know, but that's, again, that's the subjectivity of art. It totally you know, As long it's as funny it elicits how... an emotional response, emotional it, response. It's, it's validated art. There you go. <laughs> like, well, uh, the the whole Rick Roll phenomenon, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, yes. it, and it's similar to there was a video I saw from an actor lately, and it's, remember Spaceballs? Yes, so, the original one, the movie. Use oh, the yeah. torch. Remember when they're combing the desert? Yes, when they're out there combing the desert, one of the actors goes, he's like, he's like, I keep going. We found something. We ain't found shit. That guy, remember <laughs> him? Yeah, he actually did a TikTok recently, and he goes. 
I've done CSI this. He runs through his whole thing and he's like, and this is what I rem- I'm remembered for. <laughs> Yeah. You know, the same thing like with uh Rick Astley. Yeah. <laughs> you know. He's well, like, it, I had a mega hit in the 80s. I've done so many things since, but the new air that gets pushed into my career is this. People call it Rick Rolling. <laughs> and it's like, hey, you take what you can get, I guess. Yeah, you know? take what you can get. Well, yeah. it, you know, we actually covered that tune in our encore a few years ago. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. It was uh, it was truly hilarious. We had this, uh, we had Robert Randolph and the family band as our opening act for the whole summer. Amazing. And we had a horn section and backup singers and just part of the, they like the encore, they joined us, their whole band joined us on stage. So there was literally like almost 20 people on stage and two drum sets. We were having fun. And Zach came up with the idea. He's like, I want to do this. I want to do this tune. And we're like, okay, cool. And, and, we were into it 100, 100%, like no hesitation yeah. at all. It's like, I really want to do never going to give you up. And I was like, done, let's do this. And, you know, just learn the drum fill. Exactly. You know, it's like, it was great. <laughs> so much fun. And everybody, all of the fans, the first couple of times we did it, it was just look of shock and horror. Like, wait, are they really Rick rolling us? And yeah, you're getting Rick rolled right now from the stage. That's amazing. That's yeah. Great. Oh my God. Oh, you know what? It, you know, a great beat and a great <laughs> melody. You know, there's only 12 notes. You know, it's how you put them yeah. together. You got to tell a story. Right. But, you know, you were saying you don't listen to a lot of modern country music. And that probably, I mean, I probably should listen to more. I just do it to keep up with what's going on. Like, hey, like little trends, like, hey, are we keeping kick drum patterns nowadays as the bass, you know, yeah. like, that kind of thing. Just so, but that probably plays into the idea of you don't sound like a traditional down the middle, one of the 10 guys music row oh. session drummer. You sound like a, you have a completely unique voice. And, and speaking of which, um, Southern Grounds. Um, I've recorded there so many times. Great room, great drum yeah. sound. Um, is Zach, does Zach still own it? Or did I, I yeah. was like letting it, okay. Because I thought for a minute um, he was going to let it go or he was not going to work there or it was only going to be a commercial recording studio or he was just going to keep it and it wasn't going to be a commercial recording studio. It's, uh, you know, that's on him. He, yeah. he, you know, in terms of a business, he owns that. We, yeah. Uh, we're going to be there, you know, in a couple of weeks doing nice. another couple of sessions, you know, well, I, I want to come by, man. I'll come by. I'll bring you something because he's a, sh- he's a chef, right? He is the, one of his fun things. He, that he is, does. Yeah, he is. Well, not, I, you cannot say that he's a trained chef, but man, that dude can cook. That's, he's incredible. That's amazing. He, uh, he, and he has an incredible palate. Um, you never know what's going to happen if he's. If if he's behind the uh, behind the grill, you never know what you're going to get. You're going to get something amazing, though. Oh, what are some a, of the standout ones you've had? Yeah, um, you know, one of the first times I figured out that he was serious about um, culinary endeavors, he had served me this. Uh, it was a. I'm trying to think of the best way to describe it. It was a baby fingerling potato that was it was purple, but it was a sweet potato. Oh, wow. right. Mm-hmm. So it was a purple yam and it was a tiny little fingerling. And he had made this reduction that went on the top of it. That was just, it was stupid. Good. Um, I put it in my mouth. I'm like, Hey man, I, I'm going to need the rest of that pan of potatoes. And he's yes. like, "Oh man, these are hors d'oeuvres. I'm like, no, that's a main dish and I'm about to eat it. <laughs> <laughs> that is incredible. And that place is haunted is it not because i have felt things in that place okay so we <laughs> you know the hairs on the back are, of your neck when you go to the bathroom listen, down there yeah there are things that happen in that studio that are unexplained and unexplainable yeah um are you comfortable with that are you is, are you cool with it you know it's it's i here's what i think um i think there are plenty <laughs> So, you know, I'm. Uh, it's so funny you bring this up because I love watching ghost hunting videos on YouTube. It's it's my guilty pleasure. Really? And yeah. yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I have this, this one channel that I watch all the time right now called Twin Paranormal. And it's these two guys, uh, well, three guys. It's uh, 
what are their names? Ryan and River. They're twins, and then their best friend Wyatt. And they go to all these haunted locations with like infrared night vision cameras, and it's they do these investigations. And you know, in any of those circumstances, there's a huge amount of what you see and what gets recorded that is debunkable or at least potentially debunkable you can create a scenario in which the same circumstances get cre- get recreated with consistency but it's that small little sliver of unexplained um unexplainable un unde- you know you can't debunk it you can't come up with a, a, a even a possibility of how it happened and it's that little sliver that I'm really interested in seeing. And those guys tend to capture a lot of really groovy things. Um, as far as Southern Ground is concerned, um, I do believe it is, in fact, haunted. Uh, I have had, uh, I've heard all the stories. We, you know, there was our engineer that worked there for a long time, Brandon Bell. He's got some real hair raising stories. And then there's parts of the building where if you're there, by yourself you're it's not it's it's you could be in the middle of the room you know in the main room and you're just gonna feel like someone's there with you oh does yeah. it feel like uh like they mean you harm is that kind of a feeling yeah. or just they're not mean-spirited you? no they're not no, it's guys. not it's yeah it's not a it's not a menacing feeling as much as it is someone's there watching you and right. and i i genuinely feel that I mean, Ooh. there's a there's a couple of spots in the building where I'm always like double taking, like, oh, what was behind me? What was that? You know? Yeah. It's, well, uh, do you yeah. think like in those in those situations? And I've always wondered about this. That we just go, okay. Do do you guys have to scare me for real? I mean, is this like fun for you? I mean, <laughs> what is it that you want? Can we talk here? You know how do how do we do this? Do I get out an iPad and you write something and I write? How do we go about doing? How do you know? What do you need? What, how it's can a I dead help musician that never you. made it, and they're still right. trying to break into the industry. So they tap you on your shoulder. Hey, I play drums too, man. <laughs> yeah, I've, but I've, like you know, in every horror movie, you see, like even in, in um, uh, the Sixth Sense, yeah, where every single dead person's got to jump out at you. It's like at some point, does somebody have the sense to say, "Dude, stop"? Why do you? <laughs> what, can, did you just say, like tap me on the shoulder? And go, hey, I'm dead. I'm um, just letting you know. I know I kind of look freaky, but just want to you know give you a message. You, do you have to pop out from underneath the bed and scare the shit out of me for crying out loud? <laughs> yeah, I mean, come, come on, on, M Knight. Right. I I like to think that uh, whatever is at Southern Ground is a uh, is a, a former songwriter trying to get you know trying to give you that that line for the bridge that you're missing. Dang. He's oh. just lurking around, just waiting for his opportunity. Oh, wait, wait, I got that. Yeah. <laughs> well, but you know, speaking of songwriters, like Jim mentioned something earlier, I can't picture Zach Brown, the Zach Brown band, not writing the majority of the material, right? I mean, I'm sure there's some oh, outside yeah. songs, but I say no, for the most part, it's, it's uh, you know, it's really interesting. Zach will Zach will utilize outside writers. Um, so he'll bring people sort of into his circle, but he's got a, he, he's got a hand in every single song that goes on, um, the records with the exceptions of the covers that we'll do. So on, on the foundation, we did a cover of Jolene by Ray LaMontagne, mm-hmm. beautiful song. Uh, I think that I thought that that was a beautiful presentation of, of that That's song. Right, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. and we've, you know, we've there have been covers along the way that we've done on, you know, on a studio record. And apart from those, Zach has a hand in, in just about every single one. I mean, I, I can't think of any of the, all of the singles that were released to radio. He certainly had a major part in, in dreaming up what they were. Yeah. He's a highly yeah. creative dude. It's, it's a, it's an amazing experience to work with him because he, he's, he may not always communicate well in terms of what he wants, but he knows what he doesn't want it to be. Ah. And, and so sometimes you have to go through that journey of figuring out what's not working until you find what does, but that's a short journey. Usually it's, um, yeah. You, as long as you lean into it and, and be, and, and be willing to embrace his, his process. Uh, it's, it's an amazing journey. And it's like some of the things like, 
there, there have been times where the slightest little thing will jump out at him and he'll be, he'll just hone in on it and be like that. That's the thing we need to be doing. Let's do this. This is now the song. And mm -hmm. at first you're, you're the, the natural inclination on most of these ideas is to, is to kind of be a little um, withdrawn from the process and go, Oh man, I don't, I don't think that's going to work, but you have to lean into it and you have to embrace it. And then when you do, you realize that it does work and it works great. Yeah. Um, a perfect example is when we did the song Uncaged. Zach and Wyatt were uh, his songwriting partner at the time, uh, Wyatt Durrett. Zach and Wyatt had written this this song and, and we're working. I remember vividly he like called a, a sound check, which we do rare, uh, even still to this day. But we were at the Hollywood Bowl and he calls for a sound check and we go out there and he's like, I've got this song. This is how it goes. And he starts playing it on the guitar. And we all kind of settle into the groove. And then he stops playing it on guitar and he starts singing it. And we realized very quickly that what he was playing on the guitar was in seven and what he was singing was in four four and so oh my we had God. to figure out yeah and we had to figure out how to make those two things line up and line up in such a way that what he was looking to express could be expressed artistically and but it still it not did not get too crazy he wanted for it to he wanted for it to be the crazy seven eight thing but he also wanted the stability to be able to you know to sing it in four four well, how the heck? So, so seven eight and four four, or seven four and four four? Um, it's seven eight. Oh, so seven it's, eight. It's three bars of I think I think that's right. It's the three bars of seven eight, and then one bar of two four is the is the phrase for the chorus. So it cycles. It means the means the eighth the eighth. No, I mean, not the, the not the chorus, but for the verse, the choruses are in four four. The bridge is in four four. Um. The verses are, yeah, the three bars of seven, eight, and one bar of two, four, and that's the cycle. That's the cycle for the for the verse. And what I did was, in order to give him something to lock onto, is I did that Vinny Colluta thing where you run the quarter note through the odd time signature. Beautiful. And I did that on the hi hat. And so, if you listen to the hi hat to the explanation, you know, to what's happening with just that, it's a, it's a phrase of four, four. But it's that guitar part that he he was very insistent. The guitar part has to be this, and I'm not changing this. And and all of us were like, oh, we're pulling our hair out and going, oh man, this is like, this is not working because you're not playing and you're not singing the same thing twice and you're not playing the same same thing twice. And then we figured out, oh wait, he wants both of these, and it was up to us to figure out how to make it work. So would he be able to play that guitar part in seven and sing the melody at the same time? That's pretty impressive. That's what happens. Yeah. Holy so cow. It, it it took us a moment and once once he figured out that we had sort of unlocked it. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I, I how do I what do I lock in on? Like you lock in on this. And I promise you it's going to get the hi-hat's going to get you where you need to go. Nice. Vocally. We'll come around and you just point. play the guitar yeah. part and he sort of took a minute and he figured out how to make it happen and it's really cool because the vocals line up with both simultaneously it's it is the trippiest song one of the most challenging things we've done for what's me that call, what's that called so the people can look it up there uncaged uncaged, uncaged. Yeah. It's nice a, it's a title song off of the off that record okay i, I maybe I, I gotta check that one out oh man that's crazy that's crazy how about that hollywood bowl what a nice the dream venue. theater of country there you go <laughs> well and, you know an interesting <laughs> story about uncaged is i had um I got this. Uh, I had a, a message left on my phone by Greg Bissonette. Nice. Um, I've known Greg for a very, very long time. And he, the message was very, very, very short. It's like, hey, man, I'm hanging out with my friend Richard, and he and his son have your song, Uncaged. And I'm saying it's in seven. They're saying it's not in seven. And I'm saying it's kind of in four, four. And they're saying, no, it's all in four, four. And which one is right? And so it was just really sort of like kind of help somebody win a bet kind of situation. Nice. And I called him back and I explained it. Once I explained it, he goes, oh, yeah, I totally hear that now. <laughs> like, 
he, he was just kind of figuring out where my head was at and how I was thinking of it. <clears throat> and then as soon as he figured out where my head was at on it, he like sat down, apparently sat down and showed it to James and Richard. Like, oh yeah, this is what he's doing. And you know, he's crushing it in like within five seconds. Amazing. Because oh. he's he's that dude, you know, he's he's yeah. <laughs> he's such an amazing player. And so he is. He is. I think I think when you taught him my camp, you were you ended up playing on some of his play alongs that he had from his solo record. Yes. Record. Yes. I had called him up to hey man, where do I get play along tracks? He's like, just use the ones on my record. And I was like, seriously? And he's yeah, man. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> See Jim, that's what that's on my to do list is to is to create a a polite fusion record that you could take the drums off and there's charts. That's that's it's on the to do list, Chris. I got to get it done at some point. But that's so yeah, impressive. Right. You know, I saw you on the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony there with Dolly. That was major. <laughs> and so I'm thinking to myself, this this is awesome because this is one of the highlights of our job is that occasionally we get to back up these huge you know iconic right. performers. You, you over the years, you got to work with Alan Jackson, Kid Rock, Jimmy Buffett, Grohl, Cornell, Brandy Carlisle, Fogarty, Los Lonely Boys, Skrillex. Um, Dolly had to be a super highlight, but what is there a thread running through something you notice about highly accomplished, famous people, the way they live their lives, the way they interact with people? Is there a thread that runs through that as to why they are the people that they are? You know, that's Millions an interesting question. It's, um, I think what, what all of those different people have in common, and they're all different personalities, you know, sure. uh, vastly different personality wise. They all seem to have a drive for not artistic perfection, but the perfection of expression of art. Um, it, that, that's the way I perceive it. Um, and that carries out straight across that entire list of people that you, you just read off. Yeah. And there's so many more on that list that, that you didn't mention. And they all seem to have that, that same thing. Um, they're very serious about their craft nah. and, and genuinely the more talented they are, it has been my experience that the nicer and more humbler, you know, like they're so much more nice. They're so much more humble. They're so much more grounded in what it means to be a really great human being. Yeah. Um, and I think the, the, as the talent goes up, so does that ability to be a great human being uh, and be humble and still know your, you know, know your place in the world and feel confident that you're, you know that the you know all of those people are confident that they are great artists. They are confident in their ability to put out something, and it be really, really great. Yeah. Um, but they also understand that, you know, hey man, it's just it's just me putting out my art and and having my voice, and not everybody's gonna like it. Interesting. I I've always said that same thing is that the um it's it's. It's more of the mid-level acts or the acts that are struggling, still trying to prove something like I exist. And it's they're 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 not quite as nice. It's not quite yeah, a, the problems. same kind of experience. It's not as a enjoyable experience as some of the ones well, that are just huge acts. I I, I it, it has been my experience that that is very much the case. And it's that they're they feel like they have to fight their way in. Flex. And they don't realize that th at, there's a certain point at which you no longer have to fight it or fight for it. You'll always have to fight to keep it. But the 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 battle is within yourself. It's not against all these other people. You know, it's um, I have I have a uh, quotable quote for this. Uh, they choose attitude instead of gratitude. That's really, really good. You mean I like that? I'm gonna attitude deep, is man. attitude is you're you're assuming you're saying more like a bad attitude, right? Yeah, you know, attitude. You know, whenever you hear attitude, typically a lot. I think a lot of people's minds go towards the negative aspect of it. Gotcha. Instead of choosing attitude, they're instead of choosing gratitude, they're instead choosing attitude, which typically is a bad one. Yeah, it's 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 um. I, I'd say that's a that's a fair statement, though. That's a that's a, a really, mm. really beautiful way of putting it. And nice. it's, uh, you know, the 
the, the long and short of it is I, I've watched this happen with, with friends of mine, acquaintances that, you know, what did, let's just put it in, in like, I'm going to put it in quotes, the success of Zach Brown band along this journey that we've had, I've watched other people achieve success. And I, and I, and I, I, I really think that it's all what they choose for it to be. Uh, it, you know, someone said to me once, they said, Oh, wow. You know, like money and fame. It's like, you know, has it changed you guys? And, and, and I'm like, well, you know, I have a, I have an opinion about fame and money. You know, it, it's, a, and it, this has nothing to do with, or it doesn't only have to, to apply to being musicians. It could apply to being an artist who works with paint or sculpture. It could be someone who works in dance or in sports or in the, the legal profession. Um, a sudden influx of money into your life, um, the perception of people, the, all of the people around you, their perception of and their expectations really sort of start to change a little bit. And and to further that, the money, a sudden influx of money into your life really only magnifies your personality. So if you're a giving and kind person, massive amount of money into your life is just going to make you a more kind and giving person. If you're an asshole, you're going to be an even bigger asshole. Um, fame or notoriety, as it would apply to, to you know, more broadly, notoriety gives you validation to continue continue your behavior. And I strongly believe in, in, in that whole concept. Um, you are who you are, and you choose who you, you get to choose who you are. And you can make an effort to be who you want to be. And, and, you know, when you reach a, a certain point of notoriety, it's, it's just gonna, you know, your behavior gets justified in, in the eyes of others. So like people who, you know, famous rock star types who are real assholes to be around and we've seen them all. Um, everyone walks away having a bad experience or a bad interaction. They go, ah, oh, well, it's okay. You know, they're, they're a rock star, but, you know, and they kind of validate the behavior. And, and yeah. I, I really think it should be, uh, I mean, we just kind of accept it, you know? And like I said, I've watched, I watched it happen with, with uh, friends and acquaintances of, you know, I know, I know people who are real rock stars, like from way back and they are the kindest, most gentle, most humble, most, caring and giving people that i know and and they are legitimate rock stars so i've been they, writing can, about can, this. Can, can you say a name yeah. sorry jim like yeah you're talking like more like a like a someone from the 60s or 70s like like one of the skinner guys or like a folger ringo star or? ringo star there you go peace that, and love, that whole peace and love thing is yeah. not an act it is genuinely who he is it's how he is a, a truly genuine and beautiful human being jimmy buffett yeah. was that way Wow. He was just, he was, the, you could, you can sum up Jimmy Buffett in three simple words, the genuine article. And it's, wow. yeah, that I had, to, after he had passed away, somebody, somebody had asked me, Hey man, is all the, all the things they say about Jimmy true? I was like, well, what things are you talking about? They said, well, you know, that he did some smuggling and, and, and that he did this and he did that. And I said, he's the genuine article. Like, it's all going to be true to some degree. And he never hid the fact that, you know, his life may have been a little checkered at one point. Um, he, he was very open and honest about who he was, but he was also one of the most kind and giving people I'd have ever, ever met, ever had an interaction with a genuinely beautiful person. Oh man. Vaynerchuk, Gary V talks about, Oh, Jim Froze. And your legacy. Oh, there he is. <laughs> and a lot of people don't have that mind. You see it all the time. Like a perfect, like Petri dish is uh, LinkedIn, right? And even Instagram, some of these business entrepreneurs that are out there that I follow, <clears throat> Gary Vee being one of them. Um, I write a lot, a lot about, I see some of these business entre entrepreneurs trying to be controversial for the sake of being controversial, which at my stage in life, I can kind of see right through what they're saying and say, okay, is this really you and what you think? Or are you just trying to be controversial? Because if you are, then be careful of the legacy you're leaving behind. 
You know, yeah. this morning I wrote, I had an in- inspiration to write a post on LinkedIn about uh, people who divide people into, into winners and losers. I mean, that that's, I see posts like that a lot Ouch. as of late. And it's like, okay, you're either trying to be controversial or you really think this, you know? And I think a lot of the people that I know who are doing this, you're just trying to be controversial. I'm like, be careful with that. That's a legacy you're losing of what yeah. people are going to think of you, yeah. you know? I mean, I haven't met the same amount of people that you guys have, but my radio uh, background has afforded me to meet a few, quite a few celebrities. I remember all the good ones and I remember the bad ones even more. <laughs> yeah. Even more so. Yeah. You know, well, I, one yeah. thing I could say about Chris is that, you know, I've just, there's such a positive energy that's coming through this computer screen. You know what I mean? It's oh, like, yeah. I, I want to be around you. You're affable. You're a likable person. And I, the, yeah. I remember seeing you backstage years ago, and I was having trouble with my second marriage. And um, and you said, "Hey, man, if there's time to save it, um, the five love languages. I want you to read oh, that yeah. book." And um, I did read it. It didn't work, but but that's. <laughs> but the, but well, the, see, but that's the thing, and I told you. But I, you're just I remember, a smart cat. I, man. I told you. This is not going to save your marriage necessarily, but it's going to allow you to understand better the headspace that your wife is in and the headspace you are in, and you'll understand every relationship you have mm. more mm. clearly. Because you had one under your belt, right? Uh, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. All, all of us drummers, man. We got, you know, it's just <laughs> hard. You're gone, man. You're going to play the drums. You know, I, I will say this. I will say this about my ex-wife, and and I have said this, maintained this from day one. Uh, my ex-wife is, um, for better or for worse, and and I could I could be a deeply uh, embittered ex-husband and be justified for those who know all the details. Um, but what I choose to say about her is, she's beautiful, she's smart, she's really funny, and for someone else, she's the perfect girl. Um, and you know, that's the way I choose to, to treat it and look at it. Um, it didn't work out, but between the two of us at one point it it was fine. And then he grew apart, you know, and Mm -hmm. and that's just all there is to it. And, you know, sometimes things don't work out, you know, some people get a bad, you know, get a bad, uh, bad deal. You know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. you, uh, it, the there are circumstances beyond our control that will uh, affect the outcome of uh, of positivity in a, in a relationship like that. There are some of us who just are victims of our own demise. We don't know how to behave, you know, and that's mm. that's fine too. You know, I I have several friends with uh, multiple uh, marriages under their belt, and we all kind of, if you really pay attention, you can you can see the the warning signs when they're popping up and. If you pay close enough attention, you can choose to address it, and maybe it's something that is not fixable, and if and that's okay too. You know, it's it kind of sucks, but you know, it, 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 we choose what we we choose the outcome. We always choose the outcome, and you know, you wake up in the morning, you choose to uh, like you know, my wife and I do things get. Um, are things perfect? No, certainly not. Uh, do we have our ups and downs? Yes, of course. Um, it's how we deal with the downs that help the um, the whole thing stick together. Yeah. You know, and, and and trust me, there's days when she wants to kill me. You know, and and you know, we we joking. I'm I'm serious. We we jokingly we have a joke with each other. It's like, hey, well, you know, you. You suck with me. You got to die to get out. And, you know, she has said this to me repeatedly over the years. Like, you got to die to get out. And and I will reply, well, I'm not afraid to die today. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> That's a great one, man. Well, I mean, a sense Whoa. of humor, obviously, is, 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 is a requirement. I mean, yeah. Well, oh, it totally. helps. <laughs> That's a, 23 well, well, years in, I could tell you that. Yeah. No, man. Jim, Jim, Jim's got a good thing, you know. You guys are great together. Right. Really, really great together. So, you know, we 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 choose to do things. You have chosen to teach. You were telling me you are now a college professor. Is it oh, yeah. University of Alabama? No, 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 no. Uh, it's a small uh, university in Birmingham called Samford University. Oh, nice. And they, 
they had started a commercial music program with sort of a an emphasis on uh praise music oh. and we, yeah we're really really cool um they the 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 main head you know the guy teaching all the percussion students is a friend of mine dr grant dalton and yeah i know grant uh, yeah man yeah. yeah so so grant calls me up and he says hey so this is what we got going on this is what we're trying to do we need somebody we're getting in students that play drum set and they don't really have a, a bunch of orchestral experience and we need for them to improve their drum set skills would you come in and help us out and help us get this thing off the ground and i said yeah okay and um it's you know, it's a real interesting thing when you start teaching, especially on that level, you know, because these guys already kind of have a clue. They've already been playing along to a lot of music. Most of them have done gigs. Mm -hmm. um, they, it, it's, there's things that I will show them and, and, you know, they will all tell you my favorite book to teach out of is Gary Chafee Patterns Volume 3. I think that is um I think that is a key uh manuscript that unlocks uh, so much stuff in so many ways and it really kicks open the door for a lot of other things to happen and other books to go study. Um and, and for those not familiar with with the that book they really should check it out. Yeah. Um very simply presented, very kind of uh, almost ambiguous to a fault because it, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of vagueness to how you're supposed to use it, but it, it doesn't take long to figure it out and how to apply it in, in many different ways. But I teach out of that, you know, and show them a few things. And then we do the Tommy Igo um, groove essentials. You know, nice. those play alongs are priceless. They yeah. have charts and it's just a way we just go through it. And then we pick songs that they like and, and, and that they're interested in, learning how to play and how to play properly. And I think a lot of that, you know, they'll play the right notes and they go, it's just not happening. I will listen to how the, the how the hi-hat sounds, listen to how the bass drum sounds, mimic that. Don't just, don't just start slapping away. Like be a craftsman, you know? Yeah. Um, it's a lot of fun. It, it, there are times where it's frustrating. I hate having to give out grades. I hate having to. Oh, the worst part of the I semester. I hate having to yeah. do the, yeah, the, the, like the, the, yeah, the, the bell, administration the bell curve. Part. The bell, <laughs> the bell no, curve. Oh, man. You know, I'm really, and I'm really easy. Like, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to say, okay, well, you pass this class because you reached a certain point and this other person doesn't pass the class because they didn't reach a certain point. Uh, to me, it's really about seeing that they put forth effort. We all learn at different paces and we all learn in different ways. And that's a challenge for me. I have to figure out each student's sort of way. I have to unlock their brain and figure out how to get inside their noggin and help them become a better version of themselves and open up the door for them to continue to grow and learn. Um, and maybe hopefully along the way, inspire them to check out some things that maybe they wouldn't have checked out before, you know? Sure. Well, they're really lucky to have you as a teacher because, um, I never want to say anything bad about academia because I'm a product of it. I've, and I've swim around in it. Um, but there's a lot of drum set instructors that, you know, they, maybe they had a notable job 20, 25 years ago, but you're like, Hey man, I can't make your lesson today because I'm playing the Hollywood ball. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's, so there, it's there's, true. <laughs> it's heavy, you know? So they're like, this cat is my teacher is doing it currently. So all the information he's sharing with me is, directly applicable to my life and what i need to yeah do. that's amazing i love that you think you got a drum book in you yeah would you ever take the time to do that and put your thoughts to paper and go here you go this is the chris fryer drumming method you know i did so i kind of wrote one and this has been a long while back it's it's kind of I, you know i did it myself i bound it uh, myself using like the FedEx Kinko's method and just printed up a bunch of them. And the whole idea behind this thing was I would run into people at bars um, and like music festivals and they would ask me, Hey, you know, how did you, how did you get to where you can do this and that with your hands? 
And I would scribble down these exercises, you know, and uh, sometimes on a, a busted drum head or a bar napkin or whatever was available. And I would just hand it to him here, work on this and it'll help you. Um, and so I just started compiling all of those little exercises and putting them together all in one place. And so that I could just hand somebody this, like this book and go here, just work on this. And mm-hmm. it's, it's really more of an extension of the George Lawrence Stone stick control stuff. Yeah, page but it's one. about also Ooh. building endurance and control at the same time. So it's um and I'm a big fan. I'm a really big fan of using the like drum core grid exercises um to using that as a vehicle and a jumping off point to learn certain things. I think they're very valuable and they're not leaned into enough. That's my humble opinion. Yes. Um, I use those too, man. I love those. Yeah. So you have a check pattern, really simple. Like you can, in the, in the, in the the most obvious of of applications. Yeah. You have a check pattern. Let's say it's triplets. Let's say you're going to do the exercise in, in, uh, in 12A. So it's going to feel like triplets. And then you can do that. That's your basis. You know, you have the, the sort of the accent lining up. That's your check pattern. That's your grid. And then you just manipulate it any way you want. So you can add flams. You can add, you know, double strokes to each each one of those. Um, and then move it through systematically. It's um, it's a really cut and dry sort of way you could put, you could set up a, a metronome. It's ticking along. You can even put the subdivisions in. And and that's your that's your guide, and you just manipulate the exercise. Yeah. Sometimes to a um, very maniacal extent, which is what that purpose of that book was. I would take things and just move it to a maniacal end, um, and and then along the way, I learn more exercises. You know, and so when I learn something new, I'll you know I learn it, I put it into my my personal lexicon. Maybe I incorporate it into my nightly warm up, and then and go for it. And by the way. Tommy Igo, great hands for a lifetime. For life. Yeah. But dude, that advanced warm up is my go to every night. I think I'm gonna I, do that this year. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna grab that and do that this year. Cause I warm up like 30 minutes to an hour before the show and it's the same thing. Check patterns, diddles, flams, yeah. you know, you know. So I'm I'm gonna add one thing to it that he doesn't have when he teaches it. So I I still can't play it at the, uh, what is a 185 is the BPM that like top speed. It's just like smoking really fast for me. I took the whole thing and I slowed it down to like, I put it into pro tools and I time stretched it until it was sitting around 140. Wow. And then I got comfortable with it and like really precise with it at that tempo. Um, so I play it at a slower tempo, but the other thing I do is I incorporate into the beginning of the warm up. So the the very beginning, it starts out with eight strokes per hand, and as I'm doing the eight strokes, so my left hand's going down doing eight strokes, my right arm's coming up, and I'm doing the molar thing, and you know, very big. And then you do seven strokes, so these shoulder strokes become quicker, and then six, and then five. And your hands get lower, but your shoulders are still incorporated, and you're able to warm up your shoulders as oh, nice. well. And so, especially as you get older, you want to have those shoulders warmed up. You want to have your elbows warmed up. Otherwise, you're gonna you're gonna pull something, you're gonna hurt yourself. Yeah. And especially on big stages, and you know this, when you play on a big stage, you cannot help it. Your adrenaline kicks in, and you're playing with a little bit more thunder. You're putting a little bit more oomph into it. Hmm. You, you may not mean to, you may be exercising perfect form, but it's got a little more ass in it, you know? Yeah. And it's just the circumstances, the, the energy that's coming back at you from the crowd it excites you to another degree. And I think it's important to warm up the shoulders in that process. That's the only thing I've changed about Tommy's uh, advanced warm up. It's nice. such an amazing tool. Yeah. We'll have to get Tommy on the show, but I guess the next step for you would be to print that out on computer manuscript paper and then get it um, published on demand by Jeff Bezos. You know what I mean? It's like, right? <laughs> you know, you, you get a kid that, that knows the Sibelius or whatever, um, because, yeah. you know, and then you bind it up and you and then you sell it on the on the Amazon. Well, I mean, it does seem like a really good idea. I I, I should I should think about it. 
you know i i did this yeah, whole good for thought i, I literally it's it, like the book is fairly thick it's like 40 pages and it's yeah. some of it's mind-numbing you know some of it's like i said uh, it's taking things to a logical yet maniacal end yeah um it's like spock like putting, playing drums yeah i mean it's it's <laughs> it's good to help you learn something that it's you know it's not not a whole lot of musical use to yeah. be gotten out of it but that's not the point the point of this whole you know what i wrote what i compiled was to to have exercises to work on to help you gain endurance and control Amazing. with singles and doubles it's yeah and just an extension of the george lawrence stone thing and, and it was not anything i had seen out there so i just kind of put it together yeah maybe man. i'll put it out there i don't know we'll see oh just get one of these kids to be your intern and they get the credit for doing the thing and it's <laughs> it's you know everyone everybody wins so what's the schedule for this year what's your tour look like for you guys this year oh wow we um so we're going out with chesney this year so All kenny right. chesney's doing his uh his big stadium tour and if you've ever been to a chesney show you know that this is the sort of the way he does things you have um a an artist uh who comes out and they've kind of just started making a splash making a name for themselves and they're in the first opening slot uh, around 4 or 4 30 in the afternoon and then you've got like a mid-level like they draw pretty decent they're well established kind of um act that's in slot number two and then you've got oftentimes it's referred to as a co-bill but it's not a co-headline and that's where we are and we go on just before Kenny and then Kenny closes out the show. So we'll take the stage every night and play. Gosh, it's more than 90 minutes. Uh, so it's like a full show for us. Um, and, and we get to do that. And that's all basically all we're doing. We have a handful of little things being thrown into the schedule. But for the most part, we're just doing the stadium tour with Kenny. How many shows has that been? It's, I think, 28, maybe. It's an easy it's year, of, man. But, you know, so you and Nick Buda are going to be backstage just chopping out, dude. dude. That dude is amazing. He's a great driver. I, I first met Nick. He may not remember this, but I first met Nick in Charlotte, North Carolina at this. I can't remember the name of the venue. I can see how the stage looked. It was like this real weird look, like the fireplace from Beetlejuice. Uh, but like that was Coyote like the outline of the, What's that? What's the name of the? There's a play a club downtown, Coyote Joe's or One Eye Joe. Oh no, it wasn't that joint. Names. So th okay. this was a little tiny theater on, I believe, maybe it was off of Davis Street, in this like slowly becoming gentrified uh, part of town. And Nick was playing with Colonel Bruce Hampton, and oh, I yeah. was playing with uh, Oteil Burbridge. Uh, peacemakers, doing right? the and peacemakers. Yeah. yeah. So we're doing that. So he just happened to be on. I just happened, you know, and we, that's where we met and man, what a monster player. Well, I you mean, guys were playing crazy fusion music and now you guys are playing, you know, <laughs> country rock music in stadiums. It's crazy where life will take you, man. So we did that in 2015. We did 11 shows with Chesney and it was just two acts. It was us and him. And we always played first and, but we played to almost, I think almost 1 million people in 11 shows. It yeah. Crazy. It's kind of ridiculous, isn't it? It's just giant, giant all day parties. And he really treats his people. Well, I mean, the, you are constantly surrounded by lobster tails and you can have a hamburger and a <laughs> cocktail on the side of the stage at any time of the day. You know what I mean? Yep. It's like, it's, it's white glove, man. You're, you're going to feel like, time. like Zach, Zach Brown and he, you know, Kenny Chesney has certainly gone down the, uh, like uh, not mimicking Jimmy Buffett, but you know, there's there's that element of the Caribbean starting to eke into all the activities of the music, even for Zach Brown. I mean, it, it's there's definitely a void there now, sadly. But I mean, it's 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 something that uh, for you guys, if if you champion that kind of feel to the music, it makes a lot of sense. It's like a lifestyle, right? It it kind of is, and you know, it's been for us. Um, I can't speak for Chesney, you know, like where his mindset is at. But for us, it's always been sort of part of part of who we are and part of our identity is we really enjoy having that and, and doing that sort of beachy thing. Um, and it manifests itself in different ways um, throughout our discography. But it's, um, you know, Wyatt Durrett, who wrote a lot of the early stuff with 
with uh, Zach, huge Buffett fan. Zach's a huge Buffett fan, and it's just sort of seeped into it, you know. And and yeah. you can't help it. You write a song, and it has a has kind of a beachy feel. You just embrace it. You lean into it. Um, there's you know, there's all kinds of little subtle nuances that you 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 know you call it a beachy feel. You know, like yeah. what does that mean, really? You yeah. know, but it, it's. I think it. I think what makes and constitutes songs to be beach music is whether or not a lot of people like hearing it at the beach. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. No, but I mean, it's all those. Been our, it's yeah. been our sunset. You know, whenever we're at the beach, we take take a couple of beers, sit on the beach, and watch the sunset. That's our soundtrack. I know yeah. it is for a lot of people. Oh, that's so, awesome. That's awesome. Chris, I know we're keeping you for, we really appreciate your time here. It's like someone as nice as you, we're going to, we're pushing two hours, but, um, I got one more question. Oh, okay. Jim, yeah, I was just, away. I will answer as many as you have. I just was going to ask you really quick with a band <laughs> that size, are you tracking on the studio floor all at the same time? Like, are you and Danny going down drums and percussion at the same time? Or is he waiting for you to do your drum part? And he's, then he chooses the right colors to hat. Are you all recording at the same time or putting it together? How does it work? That's a big band. It's so we will oftentimes the process has been we will be in the same like so we're in the same space together. We're trying to track the drums and get a good drum take first. Gotcha. Along with a scratch vocal and a scratch acoustic guitar from Zach. And then that enables Zach to go. So we'll we'll have the basic framework. And then Zach will go to the control room and then he's sort of driving the bus from, from behind the board. And if we need to make editing changes to like the, the, the format or the feel, or perhaps maybe the form itself, we're going to, you know, we're going to take two bars off the bridge and we're going to, we're going to swap the guitar solo and, and the, the second chorus, you know, it's anything that we, any changes made like that are often made while he's there and we're still out on the floor and unless somebody plays something that's really, really great and super groovy, that sort of everything sort of is up for grabs. It could go away. Um, but anything super great that gets laid down in that process stays. Yeah. And we'll get so we'll refine it. So and then we'll there are times where it's we have the basic framework and everybody's left. And it's just me and Matt Mangano, our bass player, laying down the foundation for what's going to be built on. Um, sometimes Danny will track with us. Sometimes Danny goes back and, and does all overdubs to sort of help control the cleanliness of, of the take, you know? So when you have drums and a tracking and a drum, you've been in there. So, you know, like the drums are in that one room. Usually it's where we put up, put me and then Danny's on the other side of that landing. So there's just that glass door between us. And so to cut down on the bleed through yeah. on the take, uh, oftentimes Danny will track after the fact. So after everybody's kind of done for the day, then Danny goes in and lays down all, everything he's going to lay down. And he's so great at laying in layers and colors that you don't think about how great it is until you, you decide, Oh, I, well, we don't need that shaker. You can't really hear it. And then you pull it out and then somebody walks in and goes, Oh, something's, something's wrong with it. What got to have that shaker. Yeah. And he's, he's just a master at laying in these beautiful colors and layers it's it he is a joy to work with i learn so much from danny all the time it looks like you guys are having a killer time when you guys do your drum solo which is always nice to have a big <laughs> drum solo and he's got a th thing and you got a thing and then you guys come play together and then you got all those traditional calls get get go go get get go 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 all those traditional latin calls which are so killer um yeah we had wally on the show we'll have to get danny on the show man yeah yeah. I'll uh, I'll help you set that up. That's it, it. He's a man. He is a wealth of information. And, he sure and is. Wally's a cool hang too, man. And I'm glad you got to hang with Wally. He's amazing him. too. He's such a Wally. cool dude. Oh, Jim, what yeah. did you have? You had another question, yeah, Jimmy? <laughs> well, I see the uh, the Alabama hat. I have to ask. Um, you know, is uh, Nick Saban Nick Saban coming to uh, the Titans? You think, or is he uh, retired for good? No, he's retired for good. Uh, yeah. At least from coaching. He um, it he, he, he owns a bunch of dealerships. I know that. Yeah. yeah. So and you know he a lot of car dealerships. He's he's done very well for himself, and he's sort of reached that point in his life where he wants to be 
at home more and be available to his family a little bit more than he has in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, but more primarily, the reason he decided to, to step down as head coach, uh, it's my understanding that he just felt like he couldn't give it the proper attention that he felt that it deserved. And so rather than try to struggle with providing that, he decided that it was better to take a step back, a major step back. Um, word on the street is he's going to still have an office at Bryant Denny Stadium. And so he'll still kind of be there to offer help. Uh, he's certainly going to be around and maintain um, his presence during this transition. Because, you know, all of this is happening at, at the 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 time when kids are signing commitment letters and transfer, you know, on the team and off the team. And, and so there's a lot of, a lot of upheaval in any program at this time anyway. And then now, you know, we have a new head coach and a new offensive coordinator and it's, uh, it's a lot going on, but I think it's going to be great. I think it's going to be a good thing for the school. Um, He's been such an amazing fixture. And if you guys ever get a chance to hear him give a public address, you should definitely seize that opportunity. Oh, he's amazing speaker. Yeah. Amazing speaker. Truly yeah. amazing. I I went and heard him yeah. give a fundraising speech for, you know, for the athletic program. And I walked away going, Man, I should probably practice a lot more. I could I could I could stand to do my job better. Mm. You know, and it's just he's well, that he's that good of a motivational speaker. Nice. If you had to, I got two questions. I'm sorry. Um, sure. If you had, aside from it being a music podcast, if you were to put a podcast together, what topic would you discuss? Discuss as you Oh, my own. goodness. So my wife and I like have it could a, be a podcast sports podcast that we've been... Oh, do you? Yeah, well, that, <laughs> that would be fun, and that would be interesting. Uh, I, You know, it's so weird. I, I don't... I focus in on and hone in on Alabama football because I'm a big fan. Um so it wouldn't necessarily like if I were to do a podcast, I would I I don't by myself. I probably wouldn't do sports because I don't know enough about everything. Um, I'm just not a big sports guy. I'm re- I don't know. But my wife and I do a podcast <laughs> called really? Following the Friars, where we sit around and we just we just start rattling off. You know, we just start talking to each other. And nice, um, that's cool. Yeah, it's a lot of fun, and it, it's we haven't done any. We the the holidays got us. We had decided to like not do any for during the the holiday season, and then so we're we're waiting on things to just sort of settle down and the dust to clear. We're going to fire it back up, and I literally have have a like one of those podcasting machines, like road, uh, pod, roadcaster, road, the procaster. That's it, and yeah, I, I, know, right I set it up in our on our kitchen table. And I've got a program, and like, bing, we watch. I watch the timer, and I just cue the in, the outro music when it's time to turn it off, and we just talk about mm-hmm. anything. Uh, what typically tends to uh, to to show up in terms of subject matter is uh, adventures in babysitting our granddaughter, which is always fun. Wow! And uh, oh yeah, yeah, I'm I'm we're, a grandpa. We're and, we're of that it, age, it, aren't we, buddy? We're, we're grand people. Yeah, age. Oh God, yeah, man. We're actually. If you think about it, we could have been uh, with a different set of life choices along the way. We could have been grandpas a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> I know several people who are that are younger than it's, me. It, you know, it is um, it is a uh, it, it's a groovy gig. I'll say this much: if you if you lean into it, and and I'm blessed that my granddaughter lives right next door. Literally, wow. she can walk. Yeah, she can walk across the yard. You know, it's 50 yards from her back door to my front door, and it, she does it often. And she's five years old, and she'll she'll come across the yard, and like she comes in, she wants to play drums and piano. She's always tugging on my shirt. Hey, let's go, let's go downstairs and make some music. Okay, let's do it. Oh, and, it's like everybody nice. loves Raymond. You live right next door. That's amazing. Yeah, it's super cool. Um, it's it's a it, it's a really groovy situation. And like I said, she's she is my best little buddy, um, <laughs> one of my favorite little humans on planet Earth, and she's way smarter than me. I'll say that much. That's incredible! <laughs> Congratulations, man! Oh my God! No, sorry. Oh, hey, so I, I, and I'll ask what Jim. You got another sorry. one? <laughs> I have another question. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, Jim's on fire today. If you had to, 
Well, I love talking to this is a has been an amazing conversation, very thoughtful human being. Um, if you had to pick like, you know, tomorrow, uh, someone just said, look, your life's about to change. Uh, you are going to have to pick a tribute band and play for the rest of your life in a tribute band. Who would you be tributing? Great question, buddy. Wow, that's a good one. <laughs> I love okay. that question. I mean, we've gotten okay. a lot of Kiss. We've gotten a lot of Steely Dan. We've gotten a lot of Healy Lewis. Yeah. The Journey Police. And- Journey you know, and Joby. You know, those are all great, excellent choices. Um, I think for me, can I can I pick one and then a backup? Sure. So the sure. My first choice would be Sting. I think his body of work is exceptionally interesting. And then for an enormous chunk of that, um, a uh, chunk of his recording as a solo artist, he has had some of the biggest names in drumming uh, in the drumming chair. Uh, and I think that's really amazing. And, and he, he writes an, um, uh, he writes amazing stuff. He's a really interesting songwriter that, uh, again, it's like there's odd, odd meter things in there that don't feel like odd meter things because of the way he presents them. And, you know, it's, uh, he had Vinny playing on most of that stuff, uh, or Manu Kache or Omar oh, Hakim in the first yeah. regular, uh, the first solo record, and you know josh freeze did a record it's you know it's there's so much um information there drumming wise that would just be fun to be able to do uh i would enjoy that and then secondly even though i don't know that i could do it justice i would say um i would say frank zappa would be a very interesting tribute band to be a part of um it would be an amazing musical journey in my opinion yeah and would you would you have the charts or would you memorize it like chad wackerman i would uh i would have i would have to need that i would need the charts i would need started. the charts too i i played black page one and two in college it's like a rite of passage but man it, it would be rusty right now yeah it's uh it would you know it's but that's the musical challenge that i would be reaching for uh i actually had an opportunity to do um, to play this gig, they, it, I got called literally at nine o'clock p.m. on a Thursday night. Uh, when was this? It was like a couple of years, a year and a half ago. And the guy says to me, "So we need a drummer, and we need somebody who understands Ringo's musical sensibilities. Are you in?" And I was like, "Well, okay, sure. When's the gig? Tomorrow night." And I talked to the band leader, and the situation was. These guys, um, they do Beatles music, but with a symphony orchestra behind them. Wow. And their drummer was like stuck in a, like his connection couldn't leave LaGuardia due to weather and he wasn't going to make the gig. And so they needed a drummer. And I said, let's do this. I'll come down. We'll jam a little bit on some Beatles tunes. If you like the way it feels, then yes, we'll do it. But if it doesn't feel good, um, you know, let's. Let's not do that. You know, like we'll get you somebody else who feels better. And I sit down, we play through a couple of Beatles tunes and it was so much fun and they were smiling. I was like, so we doing this tomorrow night? And they say, yeah. And I'm a huge Ringo fan. I'm a huge Beatles fan. But being a fan and being familiar with the stuff and being able to air drum to it is different, vastly different than actually playing the music. And so I sat up with their song list and my Beatles collection, and, and I transcribed all the drum parts as best I could overnight. And overnight, Man. I spent uh, yeah, I spent um twelve hours yeah transcribing oh, wow. those parts and did the whole show. Uh, there were some parts that you know obviously they weren't all perfect, but uh, and there were a lot of times where you know it's just. Ringo would do, you know, and a lot of these song selections, the the drum fill would just be kind of a nondescript, but it's the feel of that drum drum fill that matters. The swing. Um, yeah. And with, with Ringo being left-handed, you always have to be conscious of, of if it's going to sound right, be presented right, if you approach it with the left-hand lead, it's going to be more right than not. Wow. Um, more correct, I should say. Um, 
it's just, you know, part of Ringo's thing, you know? Yeah. And so I did the gig and it was fun, but I needed charts for the whole thing. Oh yeah. Even though I'm really familiar with all of that stuff. I got no problem with charts. You know, it's like, you know, I, some of my heroes, they do just tons of gigs and, you know, our brains are uh, it's my worst muscle. I've got to have a little, <laughs> a little cheat chart there. You know what I mean? It's like, I, I've got a T-Rex brain, man. Hey, we do, we will get uh, a call. It happens several times throughout any tour, but for us, Zach will have a special guest that shows yep. up or, He'll just arbitrarily, you know, be listening to something. Go, oh man, I wish we could do that tonight. And so I will literally get a call about a half an hour before showtime. And go, hey, this we're doing this song. You got to learn it. Oh, yeah. Okay, and I'll listen to it and make a quick cheat sheet. And then I'm reading a chart on stage when it comes. You know, there's no there's no shame in it. You know, oh, if no. you if you. Just and, um, and it helps you execute. I mean, we just did that with Toby Keith. We just were at the Ford Center and like, hey, Toby's coming out tonight. We're gonna should have done a cowboy a couple hours before the show. I I scribbled out my little chart. I taped it to the hi hat stand with my little alien light shining on it. And then I called the drummer Dave McAfee and I was like, hey, this track moves between like one oh nine and one twelve. I guess they didn't record it with a click. And he goes, <laughs> he goes, yeah, you know, anyway, he's flexible, man. Anything in there. So I was like, I'm just gonna split the difference. I'll put it at like. Ah, let's it's live. Let's put it at one twelve and said play the whole thing at one twelve, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But read awesome. that chart, That's, baby. See, but, Here here's yeah, an idea I mean, for the both of you. Rich, you were doing this for a while where you kind of let the uh the everyman in on the backstage of things. Uh, you should keep on going with that, I believe, and your reels and stuff like that. Whenever that happens to you, Chris, man, document that thing. You know, be like, I was just asked by the boss to, to learn this song. So here we go. It's we're literally 45 minutes out from, you know, first beat. This is what I'm doing. I'm going to be charting the song and then record the actual performance of you playing it, maybe drum cam or something like that. Oh, yeah. And then put it out for all the world to see. That would be a cool series, I think. It's, you know, just, I have to, you know, I have to teach that at, at, uh, at the university. So I like, I, well, I don't have to, but I choose to. I think it's a very important skill set yeah. to have. Man. Reading music, uh, a lot of people will say, "Oh, you don't have to. You don't need to read music to have a career," which is true. But it's easier. There are certain times of your career that where reading music will make your life easier. And oh yeah, you know, even know, just yeah. for no other reason than being able to scribble down some notes on. You know, you could take a sharpie and scribble out some notes on what the chart kind of is on a big fat snare drum and then just like plop it down for the get, you know, for the, for the song, you know, you got yeah. your chart right there on the snare drum, you know, super easy, write your, write your performance notes on the drum with a Sharpie. Why not? Chris, you're an awesome mm -hmm. cat. We're going to, we're going to let you go, but if we can, you can ask, answer five quick questions. We call the favorite five top of mind. First thing that comes along favorite color. Okay. Favorite color purple favorite drink and it could be just you know boring or alcoholic uh a kentucky mule oh what's in that it's the same thing as a uh a, a, the uh, moscow mule but yeah. bourbon instead of vodka oh i love that man okay favorite food it could be your favorite ethnicity or it could be the favorite dish mm -hmm. indian food Oh yeah, like chicken tiki masala and the sock. Yeah, like a like a uh, like lamb rogan josh or something like that. Oh, and the naan. Nice. I could just eat pounds yeah. of naan, just dip yeah. in it. Yeah. Oh my god, incredible! This is but hard for a lot of people. Which yeah, favorite movie? Yeah. Favorite movie? Pulp Fiction. Uh, you can watch it over and over and yeah. over and over, and you could see yeah, something new every time. Oh. It's a remote drop movie for me. Just drop it. Uh, doesn't matter where it is in the movie. I'm watching the end of it. Kind of like The Big Lebowski, except that's two different movies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Okay. And then this is really difficult for some people, but favorite song. Is there a favorite song? Something that comes on the radio you're listening to. You're cranking it up. Rosanna by Toto. Oh, oh my God. Yeah. Awesome. A lot of information there as a drummer. A lot of cool stuff happening. Lots. Oh, yeah. One but of the, the toughest the, songs to play. Oh, yeah. To get yes. all, you know, to get all the balance with all the ghost notes and keep the flow yeah. going. What a genius. You know, the fact that Jeff had that body of work and left us at 38 years old. I think about what I was doing at 38 years old and it was good. I was in the game. I was, but I didn't have that kind of body of work. Holy cow. 
Yeah. At 38, I was at the age of 38. I was just joining Zach Brown band. Look at that. Yeah. Oh That's, man. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. I love it. This Pretty was such a, such a great conversation. Um, you know, just really fantastic. You're a world-class drummer, world-class human being. Everybody check out Chris Fryer, F R Y A R Chris Fryer, dot com and i checked out the dot com there's tons of great insights and advice and oh that's you know i haven't been on there to update any of that in a long 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 time so if there's there's probably a lot of information missing from that <laughs> well the first thing i i do when i see a lot of websites i'm like the hardest thing to keep up with is the tour dates you know they always kind of yeah. you know fall by the wayside but there's tons of great vice your favorite um method books your favorite drummers your favorite favorite ways to solo soloing over vamp soloing open yeah. solos it's like cool cool stuff for people to check out you know if, if if anyone ever has any questions just find me on social media and send me a message yeah. and you know on facebook messenger or on instagram and even on twitter like just find me, send me a message. I'll be happy to you know have a conversation with anyone. It's just you know to me that's part of being a drummer and being part of this amazing community, and uh, you know just like how much we share and interact with each other. It's it's a really beautiful thing. It is the drum community is unbelievable. Everybody go check out the uh, Zach Brown Band on tour with Kenny Chesney this year, and Chris will be playing his Gretz drums, Gibraltar hardware, Zildjian cymbals, Vic Firth drumsticks, Evans drumheads, and his HQ practice pads. Well, so HQ <laughs> is uh, owned by uh, HQ is owned by uh, Evans Diodario now. now, right? Yeah, so that's yes. all the Daria. Yep. And I switched from Gibraltar to DW last oh, year. Oh, good. See, well, we're 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 homies. Yeah, man, that hardware is amazing. You can build oh. a house on it. Oh yeah, are you playing the pedals too? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I am. I, you know, there was a little bit of. Uh, I don't like the accelerators. The way they feel is a little weird for me. Mm -hmm. And so it, it was. Uh, it was. I had to. We had to hunt down some turbos for me to play on. I love the way those things feel. They're solid as a rock. You can. You can just about use them as a boat anchor. You know what I mean? It's like it's. They're heavy, heavy duty. You cannot. Well, I, I don't want to say you cannot break them, but I don't feel like I'm going to break one. <laughs> i love it man i hope not you know we're such boy scouts we got to have those extra pedals extra snare drum extra everything waiting in the wings yes we do just in gotta case have it otherwise it just makes life difficult well i hope you have a great year man and i hope i see you in the flesh and if i can help out at the university if you ever bring anyone i'd love to come talk to the kids yeah, I'd be hey, that would be great i'm gonna take you up on that I'd, I'd love to do it man jim thank you for your time and talent today buddy great yes, questions sir. Uh, and to all the yeah, to all the listeners out there, be sure be sure to subscribe, share, rate, and review. It helps people find the show. And until then, ah, we'll be back next time. Thanks so much, Chris. Appreciate it, man. This has been the Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.